Thanks. Okay, go for it. Um, so I'm still new to this format and like the idea of like the class notes is yeah. still new to me. Can you explain it once again, please? Sure. So I'm just asking you to take a formal set of notes in a style that I dictate. So I'm trying to help you through how to take notes for a stats class. And since we're going to be mixing code and like fancy math symbols on a computer, I'm forcing you to use this R markdown format. Now you can add to the course notes, basically whatever you want. I encourage you to add material that you think future you will find beneficial for what we cover in the course. As for a minimum required uh, material to put in your course notes, I'm gonna ask that you put in um, like bold words that we define in the class and then definitions of those words and then maybe some examples uh, to help you understand the definition a little bit better. Now, what some people have uh, asked if they could do and should be helpful is adding their own definitions alongside of the more strict definitions that I give, because hearing the definitions or reading the definitions in, um, let's say, two different voices can be helpful. So in the video, I laid out kind of how I want that style to look for your course notes. And I encourage you to follow along with that as you develop your course notes. Was that a, an adequate description or do you have more specific questions? Yeah, um, is it, can I type it in my computer or can I like write, jot it down on like a notebook? So you can of course jot down uh, whatever we cover in the class or whatever we cover in the videos in your notebook. Um, if that's your preferred style for taking notes, by all means, I'm not going to limit you from doing that. But you are going to submit a typed set of notes to me for the majority of your grade in the class. Okay. 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 Great question. Thanks. I didn't actually see who asked that, but that's okay. It's uh, me, Allie. Oh, Allie. Thanks. I appreciate the question, Allie. Any other questions before we get going? Yeah, I was just wondering um, how we're supposed to know what videos to be watching for Wednesday's sessions. Right, so I'm going to, I've already posted the videos, but I am going to make an announcement on it after this section because I'll upload this recorded uh, lecture to the videos at the same time. So I'm sharing my screen with you. Um, so you can, let's see, I realize I don't have it zoom, I don't have it on full screen there. So I'll zoom in to try to help you see. And I think you can see now. So the way I'll keep it organized, uh, Caitlin, was that your question? Yes. Thanks. The way I'll keep it organized is week one has a YouTube playlist associated with it. Hopefully you already watched those. We are now in week two, so there will be a new YouTube playlist for all things you're supposed to watch this week, which mostly means Wednesday, as you asked. So I'm going to try to keep it organized by week and name for each week, and each week we'll get a YouTube video with a number of videos for you to watch. Does that make sense? Um, and for like the notes that we take, should they include the asynchronous sessions or just the synchronous sessions? Uh, yeah, they should include both. Thanks. Alex. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Totally. Yeah, and I'll send out weekly emails to update everyone um, once I have the playlist for the week finalized so that you all are like queued to go look at the website for the updated content. The only reason I haven't done it yet is because we haven't finished recording this lecture yet. So about an hour after this lecture, when my computer finally processes the uh, video recording from this lecture, I will update that video, update the playlist, 
and then send an email out to everyone. I think I was just confused because I didn't know that there was a playlist under week one. And so I actually went to the zoo there to the YouTube channel and was just watching what was the most current in there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That would be horribly confusing. <laughs> I will try to provide more structure than that. I know I don't provide a lot of structure, but I'll try to provide more than that. Awesome. I think that's Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Caitlin, thanks for asking. I think that's essentially Ali's question too is. Uh, why is there such little structure in my course notes? <laughs> okay, other questions. Those were great questions. Thank you both, Allie and Caitlin, for um, asking at the beginning of class. I'm happy to entertain some other questions as we get going. Um, how do we know if you're like missing um, a course note? Um, because how do we like follow up with them? Yeah, so what I encourage you to do is come to office hours and then show them to me, share your screen and ask, are these going well? Am I doing as you expect? Uh, or should I do things differently? Or have I missed some things? Um, so I encourage you to show up to office hours and ask. Uh, if you like can't show up to office hours one particular week, but you absolutely need a response from me that week, uh, email me your course notes and I will happily provide you feedback. Yeah, I'm very, I'm trying to be very open for feedback on our course notes as we go through the semester. But that definitely takes some uh, motivation on your all's part to actually show up to office hours or email me and ask questions about them. Okay, I'm gonna put out, yeah, yeah, there we go. Will this be the first uh, lecture then that we need to be starting notes on, or were me, were we meant to also take notes on last week's? This is like, it right here, Josiah. Okay, First cool. lecture for which notes should be taken in our formalized course notes. Awesome. Yeah. So we put this under week one or week two. Okay, Josh, that is up to you. How you want to organize your course notes is up to you. Uh, I showed you how to make section uh, headers in your course notes, and you are more than welcome to name those section sections as you want. If you think because the content started this week, so you want to call this week one, uh, I think you'll get a little confused with my numbering as we go through the semester, but that's up to you. They're your course notes. If you want to name them by title instead of by time, go for it. The only thing I'm really going to show you how to do as the semester progresses is how not to get overwhelmed by one file of all your course notes throughout the semester, because it's going to be a pretty tall file by the end of the semester. But I'm going to show you uh, tips and tricks to manage the size of the file as the semester goes. But my tips and tricks do not depend on your organization scheme. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, that was almost 10 minutes of questions. We do have content to cover today in class, so I'm going to press on. Uh, there was a pretty robust discussion after uh, the class yesterday, uh, earlier today, um, so I encourage you to stick around and ask me some follow-up questions if you have them uh, after class, and if you can't, by all means, there's office hours uh, for the rest of the week, plenty of times available. So here we go. A quick definition of a set. Um, a set is a collection of unique objects. Hopefully that's not too difficult. We write them, that is sets, with curly braces. So you all are going to have to tolerate that our first set example is going to be surrounded by a left curly brace that looks like this atrocious looking thing here, because my handwriting uh, electronically has not yet improved for the semester. All right, so you all tell me, what sort of things are you interested in? We can have sets of whatever, numbers, uh, in the first section, we had dogs and planets. So let's try to keep the examples different just for fun. If nothing else, humor me. What are you all interested in? Let's make a set of it. 
Memes? Memes? Calvin wants reggae artists. You are really uh, appealing to <laughs> what I'm interested in here. Uh, okay, memes. Draw in a blank. Give me some examples. Franklin roasting Lamar. I don't even know what we're talking about. Stock market is a meme? What is dog that, coin? That stock market may be a separate uh, suggestion. For the moon. The, the meme is the meme idea is too much. I don't know what the hell we're talking about with the meme. So <laughs> we gotta move on. How about just stock tickers? That seems like what people in the chat are curious about. Oh gosh, thankfully something I can do is G O O G is Google, right? <laughs> what else we got for tickers? Sorry, we have the GME. Oh, gotcha. T S L A. Yeah, there we go. GameStop apparently was huge recently. GME. What is GME? GameStop. AMC. Oh, okay, okay. You do AMC. What is AMC? The AMC movie theaters. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, nice. Okay, here we go. We're going to call it there. Do our sets need to contain all the possible stock tickers available? Is it still a set if I close it right here? Yeah. I, I don't see why not. Absolutely. Indeed. Both who answered are totally right. So we're going to name this one. Um, uh, T, because who cares? There's a set named T. Okay, how about another example? Another topic, and apparently something that I know, something that I understand here, y'all. Give me something I can work with. Video games. Video, no, that is not something I can work with. All right, you ready? Uh, Zelda, because that's the one I used to play on, no joke, Super Nintendo. What else we got? Mortal Kombat. with a k with that one right i think so yeah all right okay uh you know what i used you know what i used to play as star fox am i dating myself with these Elder well here's Scrolls. the thing you said that you couldn't speak video game language but these are some valid video games and these are some valid ones i just didn't want to date myself there yes i is what i didn't want to do star <laughs> fox is up. the best <laughs> <laughs> nice thank y'all uh okay uh, we wanted one. We wanted one last one. Lego stars. Oh, and I missed Hollow Knight. Okay, that'll be the end of it. Okay, there we go. So we have some sets as some quick examples. I'm going to keep this moving on, though, because we're going to need uh, to cover a few more things. Sets can be anything. I don't care if they're stock ticker symbols, if they're video games, or if they're numbers, which they're going to be for the most part in this class. But uh, the number examples, I'm going to have plenty of, plenty of them for us later. So I'm glad we came up with some new stuff here. You all are going to see me do stuff like this every now and again. Essentially, I'm trying to keep these notes as a PDF to give to you once this recording is over. So you just have to kind of put up with that bit as it goes. Would you mind going back for just a moment? Sure. Basically during that whole page, I was trying to bring up our studio and figure out the formatting again. So that way I can just try to shortcut my time and do it as we go. And now I have a screenshot, so you're good to move on. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Um, often sets are enclosed by a bigger set, which is called the universal set or the sample space. 
we are generally going to use the word sample space for an enclosing set. Now, a enclosing bigger set is just going to be like the set of all stock tickers. Uh, we certainly only had a few of them. So an enclosing space, the sample space, could be the set of all possible stock uh, symbols. Or, of course, the set of all possible video games that have ever been created by anyone. Um, so we will call that the sample space as far as this class is going to be concerned. The objects contained in a set are called elements. And we denote an element, let's say little a, is in a set capital A with this funny little symbol, it's almost, it's almost like a little C with a line in it. Almost like a little E, but I'm not intending to close it. That should not be closed right there. Uh, Jared's asking, are you closing with curly braces? Yes, yeah, sets have a left. So the set A, it could be, here's my left curly brace just the set one, two, three, and then a right curly brace to close it. Thank you. Totally. In LaTeX, you would write A backslash in will give you this funny little symbol. Backslash in will give you this funny little symbol in LaTeX inside our markdown. So if you wrote out dollar sign A backslash in uh, capital A dollar sign, you would literally get this notation in your R markdown file. So I'm going to, uh, throughout this lecture, give us a number of different LaTeX symbols so that we can start developing our um, repository, let's say, of LaTeX symbols as we go. And the first one we're going to get is in. When there is an element x that is not contained in a set, we just put a slash through that in symbol. And in LaTeX, you would just do backslash not backslash in. And I'm just going to leave out the a, the element, and the capital A, the set, just so you all can type this out. And you'll figure out what to do with it as you go, I'm fairly certain. Okay. Any questions before I move on? What is that? So, what is that last? After him. This one? Uh, no, like the word. Uh, an object. Oh, slash not slash in. So if you want to say the negation of the in symbol, this thing, you'd go backslash not backslash in. Did that answer it, Chris? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so an object. This one. Is not and yeah, yeah, and the set is what does that say? Den denoted is that denoted? denoted? Okay, sorry. Let's give it no, don't apologize. <laughs> it's definitely my fault for not being able to write on a computer. Denoted, thanks, Chris. By all means, interject when you don't understand something. If I does, my handwriting is getting too sloppy, say so, please. Ah, uh, spacing does matter. I see. So in LaTeX, it seems that. You only want the backslash in for the symbol. If you want this symbol, you'll do backslash in. But you can't just do it with no space. Here? Right. Yeah. Uh, between the, the money signs. I believe. You can, no space. Oh, then maybe I'm not understanding quite. So you're supposed to do- Space. Not backslash? Backslash not backslash uh -huh. in. I see, gotcha. Yeah, 
yeah, it'll take us a little bit to kind of get the hang of LaTeX as we go. It's a uh, it's a funky little system. It was developed a long time ago, if so you it put certainly in, has its uh, quirks. If you put an A after the N, you have to have a space in between the N and N and the A. Oh, Jacob, indeed, you can't attach another letter to the right hand side of the word in because then the word is I N letter, not the word in. So you necessarily have a space there. The key word here is in, not in with whatever the letter of the set is. Cool. Yeah, tokens in programming, they're tough. <laughs> okay, moving on, uh, save that one. Here we go. We've got subsets. That's going to come next. A subset of a set is written like A is a subset of B. A is a subset of B if and only if when X is in A, then X is in B. I encourage us to stop and think about this one for a little bit, subsets. You have a smaller set A whenever any element contained in A is contained in B. You have a subset written out like this, such that whenever an element is in A, that element is also in B. If it's in A, it's in B. In that case, A is a subset of B. It's now, not this, any, oh, sorry, it's, it's not any element of A, right? It'd be all elements of A? Sure, this holds for all elements of A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, sure. Now, this is like a little C with a line under it. And that line under it is suggesting that A could be equal to B, implying if A was B, B is a subset of itself. That is totally reasonable statement. Any set is a subset of itself. It seems silly, but it's it works out. What what is so this, between the money signs for the subset? Is it subset subset EQ? equals? E, yeah, exactly. Subset EQ, which is telling you what this line underneath the C symbol means. That it is either a strict subset or it could be equals to. Thanks. Yeah. OK, so let's just do a new one then. We could have a proper subset. We would write A is a subset of B, and we don't have the equal sign in there. Suggests A is not equal to B. This is a proper subset. A is strictly smaller than B. Oh, sorry. And I should also give you this. Subset, no equals, no EQ, and you get the strict subset. It's a proper subset.
two sets are said to be equal if they're subsets of each other. That is, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. As long as both of those hold, then A, a set, is equal to B. Now, in some other versions of this class, they might drag you through a bunch of different proofs where you have to prove that a set A is equal to a set B. And then you have to show both of these hold at the same time. I don't think that's actually super informative to make you do a bunch of these proofs in a class like this. So we're just going to state it and then move on. And if that's OK with everybody else, I will do so now. talk it's if and only if a is not a subset if they are subsets of each other then they are equal so a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a then a is equal to b okay yeah it just takes a little bit to like think it through and make it stick in your mind really kind of just takes some repetition and we're going to get that in this class. Um, the way this material right now is working is it's all kind of building to some stuff we're going to do in the future. So my thought is introduce sets early on so you get exposure to them first and quick. And then when we come back to it later on in the semester, about halfway through the semester, we're going to come back to this material. And so seeing it again, I think will help you memorize it. But it does take a minute to, to kind of make all this sink in. There is such a set as the set with no elements. We denote it as the empty set. It's like a zero with a diagonal slash through it. That is not the Greek letter phi. Is a zero with like a diagonal slash through it. And if we wanted to write it out in our symbols, oh, look at that, my curly braces are improving. If we wanted to write it out with curly braces, we just put two curly braces and nothing in between there. This is the set with no elements. We call it the empty set. The empty set is not this. A lot of people will want to do this, but I got to stop it real early on. This outer set, this outer set has one element in it. The one element contained in this outer set is the empty set. That's annoying, I know. Math is silly. This outer set contains one element. The element that this outer set contains is the empty set. So this is not the empty set. We denote the empty set like this. Gary, I applaud the effort with the empty set, but more formally, we use this one. Backslash empty set. No, 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 no worries. It was a, it was a valiant effort. It was pretty good. Y'all ever heard of the transitive property? For sets, it works like this. If A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C.
is is it okay if you think of it like um a Russian doll, like a doll within a doll within a doll? Yeah, totally. <laughs> it totally is. If you have doll A contained within doll B, and doll B is contained within doll C, then in some sense, doll A is contained within doll C. Is that what you mean? Yep. Yeah, totally. That works out great. I like that example. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Big the Russian doll analogy too. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Okay, let's do some number examples. The natural numbers are going to be denoted like this. It's a capital letter N, and it's uh, got this extra line on the left of it. In some sense, it's made bold. And that's equal to the set of uh, whole numbers, non-negative whole numbers. And that set just keeps going. I can't list them, so I won't list them. In this class, I'm gonna start the natural numbers at zero. If I want to exclude zero, I will put a plus subscript. On that capital N. And in LaTeX, you can get that capital N as backslash math B, B, the second letter of the alphabet, B, B. Curly brace N, capital N, curly brace, dollar sign. Backslash math B, B, curly brace N, curly brace. So even though on uh, our studio that comes out as the double lines being the middle, like the diagonal of the N, that's still fine? Yeah, I just struggle writing that one cleanly. I see. Okay. So how about this one, uh, Josiah? You'll see it here. The integers is a set, and it's denoted Z. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have no idea what that symbol is, because I struggle to write it, go into our studio and type out math, B, B, curly brace, capital letter Z, curly brace dollar sign. And you will get a much better symbol for the set of numbers called the integers, which extend off to negative infinity. Uh, they include all the negative integers, zero, and all of the positive integers. And they extend off to positive infinity. So again, I can't write them out. So I won't write them out. How did you but write I, the uh, suffix or prefix or like whatever the little sub t or sub plus sub plus oh yeah good question so you can go sub plus so underscore will get us a That's afterward mm -hmm. oh whoops it, awesome. you're right it needs to be within the dollar sign okay but outside of the curly brace perfect thank you yeah good catch yeah, to get any kind of subscript, all you need is an underscore attached to the thing you're trying to subscript. And later on, we're going to put a lot of stuff in subscripts. So you could, it won't be meaningful right now, you could go underscore curly brace plus curly brace. And the only reason you should use the curly braces following an underscore is in case you want to put more than one symbol in a subscript, which we will do eventually. As in if it's only one uh, one little symbol, not worth character. it, and it's just clutter. Yeah, one character, then it's just cluttering to add the braces. Correct. Um, what's the difference between a subset and a subscript? Oh, sure. A subset of the natural numbers would be like one, two, three. It's a subset of N. Subset. And this is a subscript.
So a subset is like a mathematical set that happens to be contained within a bigger set. And a subscript is like uh, some notation on letters in various languages. I don't know which or how many, but certainly in English. How do you type the C with the line under it? Uh, this one? Yeah. Subset EQ? Yep. Nice, huh? I appreciate us trying to make the class a reasonable space for you to ask questions. So I appreciate y'all asking questions. It's going to slow us down, but that's the way class works. And I'd prefer to answer your questions than be too concerned about our time. If only okay, we good? Each, each teacher were like that. <laughs> well, you know. Josiah, remind me to give you 20 bucks later. <laughs> um, um, worth noting for people that are um, following along and mark down, um, in order to put a line break, you have to do a double space. I figured that out. Like you can do a line break. Line. Yeah. You can do a line break within the same line of, of like code, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So like you want to organize it, you have to, you put a double space at the end and then hit enter and then it'll actually line break. Otherwise it won't. If you just put an enter. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. So sometimes we want to write out fancier sets. So we're going to use set builder notation as some extra syntax that basically says create a set based on some rules. So we might say there's a set named E that's equal to all the X's. Uh, let's just, let's start out a little bit simpler than I had planned. Let's say all the values X such that X is in, now this is a little annoying, but I think it highlights the idea well. This is a really obnoxious way to write the even numbers, the set of even numbers. You could recognize we could have just done it like this. But my point is here to show us set builder notation. We are going to define a set with curly braces. And it's the set of all elements x such that, that's what this colon is here to mean, such that x satisfies some condition. And as long as x satisfies some condition, then those are the x's we want in our set to be defined by set builder notation. OK, so let's try another one. Here's a set f. We're going to say all the uh, values, all the real numbers x, such that a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b. This is what we call an interval. of all the elements from A to B for whatever A and B might be. Okay, let's try again. This one's gonna look a lot like the last one. The only difference is I'm using strictly less than now. Whenever we talk about strictly less than, we will use parentheses instead of square brackets. So square brackets are written to include to include the bounds of the interval. And the parentheses here suggest you are excluding the bounds. OK, so bring it on. Here's another set. The rationals. We denote it by Q with one of those bars alongside it. And it is the set of all numbers that you can define as a fraction 
where p is an integer and q is an integer but not equal to zero. We call the set of numbers that are defined by fractions of integers, the rationals. The rational numbers are the set of numbers you can write out as fractions of integers. That's pretty sweet. Do you all know the real numbers? Are bigger. What's the last example on the previous page. Yeah, could you go back one second? Oh, yeah, totally. I got a screenshot of it. Thanks. Totally. Yeah, sorry about that. You're good. We okay now? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Do you all know the real numbers? There are numbers that cannot be written as fractions of integers. Can you all name some? Pi. Nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a perfect example. What else we got? I. Nice. Imaginary numbers, I guess. E. All, OK, so all, OK. I probably asked the question poorly. All imaginary numbers are theoretically numbers you can't write out as um, fractions of integers. However, they don't qualify as real numbers, anything with imaginary parts. So let's just keep this simple and get rid of imaginary stuff because the complex numbers are an even bigger set than the real numbers. So how about one more example? There's like another classical example of a function that is not complex, does not have any imaginary part, but you can't write it as a fraction. I think log, um, natural log, is, does that count? Uh, that's zero? actually a function. Is, is it zero? Uh, zero you can write out as a fraction. Okay, I'm going to spend the time to do this one here. Just you all clear. are to imagine that this is a perfect square. <laughs> Can't you tell? <laughs> mm -hmm. How long is that diagonal? If two. the two sides are equal to one. Square root of two. Square root of two. Yep. You all know that is a crazy number that you cannot write out as a ratio of integers. Oh, so it's right here. It's right here. Why can't we write it out so easily? It seems insane. So if we were to write this out, we'd have the natural numbers excluding zero is a subset of the natural numbers, is a subset of the rationals, is a subset of the reals. We are going to deal with real numbers quite a bit in this class. What's the E called? This one? Yeah. E. Uh, Euler's constant? I was wondering if uh, our studio Just had. E. Yeah. Just E, yeah. Okay. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. How do you write the um, the less than or equal to symbol 
like with the, oh, the less dense question. symbol with the line under it. Yeah. Backslash L E Q. Thank you. Yeah. And you can also get backslash um, G E Q for greater than or equal. Cool, cool. Thanks. So we're not going to make it through all of that I want to say about functions, but I'm not particularly worried about that. I think what I'll do is just make an extra video to finish up my lecture on um, functions, and I'll just post it to next week's videos. Does that seem like a fair compromise? Yep. Sounds good. Great. So uh, we do have three minutes, so I'm going to try to get some of it in, but we're just not going to get all of it. So here we go. I'm going to write out functions a lot in a notation you all probably haven't seen. So I'm going to say functions are maps. They're maps from one set S to another set T. And the way I want you to think of this is like, here is a set S and here is a set T. The function F takes you from X in s to f of x in t. So this is a map. A function is just a map that takes you from one set to another set. So in fact, you could make believe that all of what you've studied about functions so far fits this definition. You don't even have to make believe that hard. All you have to do is think about the x-axis as the set S. Often we think of the x-axis as the real numbers. So in this case, that is the set S. And the y-axis here, which I'm just not going to label as y because I might use it as an element later. This vertical axis is the set T. So all a function does is maps you from elements in S to T. In the world of statistics, we are going to put a bunch of properties on S. We're going to define a set of functions that are going to be of great interest to us based on the size of the set S and some properties of the set T. In the world of math, we call S and T the domain and the codomain. So in the world of statistics, we are going to define a set of functions that's going to be of great interest to us. And the set of functions is going to have uh, domains of varying sizes. And that's the part we're not going to get to in uh, today's lecture is how do you define the size of a set sort of stuff. So in the world of statistics, we're going to be interested in a set of functions where the set of function depends on the size of the domain and some properties of the codomain. So I'm going to need these two pieces a lot in the world of statistics. So that is 350. That's our time for now. I'm going to finish up in a YouTube video for next week, not two days from now, but next week. Uh, the last bit of our discussion of functions here. And otherwise, if you need to get out of here, that is uh, the end of our time. I'm going to stop recording lecture here, but I'm happy to stick around for an extra five or 10 minutes to answer anybody else's follow-up questions.